Anybody recalls two topics, right? The majority of the time we uh, discussed service operations, and we discussed the differences of uh, service operations that we had, right? And when we talked about service operations, we um, discussed the problem or uh, we have to manage uh, variability in the process entered through the customer, right? <clears throat> We discussed um, options, um, how we manage variability. Can anybody recall this mm, of managing variability, what it was? There was one slide where we spent a considerable amount of time with. You guys remember that? We used as an example, I think it was Starbucks, when we talked about the five types of variability, right? Can you remember this? Hmm? You guys remember this? Yes, no? Uh, Little, what do I think? Would be great if you could remember this for the exam, for example. So we talked about the different types of variability, right? <clears throat> and that was kind of, sort of linked to the customer entering uh, service processes, right? Because we discussed firstly arrival variability, right? Then we discussed request variability, capability variability, uh, effort variability, and the last one, subjective preference variability. Right? And then we saw um, what is um, the difference between them. No worries, uh, Arrival variability was the different times that uh, customers may, may uh, uh, arrive request variability. Uh, uh, customers have different preferences and request different offerings, right? And then capability variability uh, was to what extent is the customer knowledgeable about um, the service process or the service experience. Effort variability was about the extent that the customer brings uh, or works with us as offering the service variability. And we said, uh, as an example, I think we gave like, you work with a tax consultant and you work together with him to do the tax returns for you, right? And then the last one is the subjective uh, preference variability, right? And in the subjective preference variability, meaning we discussed that if even if you go with your colleague or your friend uh, to watch a movie, uh, some may have a, you two may have a, a significantly different uh, experience of going to that movie. One might enjoy it, one might not. One is in a better mood, one is in a worse mood, one is tired, sleepy, the other one is enjoying the movie, right? Now, very much related to the subject preference variability was uh, what we discussed yesterday in terms of what is called the gap model of quality. Can anybody explain this to me? What was the, the gap model um, of quality? Anybody recall what that was? Hmm? What was that? Do we remember this? We had a quite a lengthy discussion about the gap model of quality yesterday. You guys remember that? It was kind of similar because it was looking at the process uh, of the customer entering the service process, right? 
And uh, when entering the service process or before entering the service process, you and me, we have certain expectations, right? As Xing Lam writes here. So we have expectations about uh, uh, how this process, uh, or how, how this process should be performed and, and how you would be, uh, I guess, uh, delighted through the service experience, right? So when you go um, to a McDonald's, you would have certain expectations, right? What we said with regards to the service process itself and also the product offerings, no? And then once this package is over, so you leave uh, the service experience or the service uh, process, then you have uh, your perceptions, no? Basically, you make up your mind whether your expectations were met or not. Right, and then we said we have these three different scenario. I can, the expectations may exceed your perception. Then you, then you have a gap in quality. So you would probably view this as, a, as a, not such a good quality service experience. Or your perceptions are actually higher than your expectations. Then you, you would think um, it even exceeds what you expected. You would have a very, very positive evaluation of this. Or it could be equal, right? That the perceptions meet the expectations. So uh, that scenario, uh, you would be somewhat satisfied, right? So these were the three options that we had. So this is what we discussed, right? And this is, um, I, I would uh, suggest important for, uh, for the exam and you may wanna have another look uh, to revise this, okay? We also look in different types of service processes, which are similar to manufacturing process types, right? If you guys uh, remember uh these three that we discussed the professional services service shops and mass services would also be advisable if you could check this again before the exam okay and then um after the break we started is uh session number four which was the design of products and services right where you had to do an exercise uh, where you were faced with the task of redesigning uh, the shopping trolley. Okay, so we started that session basically with going that direction. And then after doing so, we uh, looked at how uh, the professionals are actually uh, doing that and what they came up with. We looked at a case study of a company called Ideal, right? A company situated in Silicon Valley that does um, design consultancies for uh, major companies, right? And uh, there we saw the, the process of redesigning the shopping trolley, right? And today we're going to take a much more closer look at this um, design process of redesigning uh, uh, products, uh, designing new products, right? And this is our uh, session for, for today. Can you guys see my screen? I suppose so. Right. Okay, let's start. So, what are the key questions that we are trying to answer here in this uh, lecture? Uh, firstly, what is product service design? Are product service design objectives specified? Is the product service design process defined? Are the resources for developing products and services adequate? Are product service design and process design done simultaneously. 
You guys also recall that um, you had to, or I gave you uh, a case to, to have a look at. Did you guys have the time to at least read the case uh, that, I, that I assigned you to uh, yesterday? Uh, you guys recall what, what that was or not so much? Yes, right? Um, so the case, oopsie, was uh, these uh, roasted chips case, right? And the case was about um, um, Monica Allen, who was a technical vice president for a company that does uh, snacks or just uh, food items, right? Groceries. And they are developing a new uh, food item where they had like, a, I don't know, a crisp outside, soft in the inside and some form of dairy in the middle, right? It sounded uh, complicated and they had uh, three major issues uh, with that, okay? There were some questions associated with this, okay? Um, I will leave that for now, because I first want to introduce the topic and then we go through the questions and then it will be easier to provide answers to these questions, okay? But um, just to say, I haven't forgotten about this uh, case, which we will discuss today later, okay? Now, let's do this. So what is product service design? It's basically a process in itself <clears throat> of defining of in order to fulfill a specific market need, right? So again, we are at the process of adding as much value as possible from a customer perspective, right? So the outcome of this process is a fully detailed product or service that can be then produced on an ongoing basis, okay? Well, I want to stress this ongoing basis, right? Because there's a difference between prototyping and um, production, right? And companies are, are regularly struggling to come from uh, prototyping and then to uh, mass production, okay? And we will discuss this. You also saw this um, in the you read yesterday, okay? Um, the design of the product and service and the process of manufacturing these ones or offering these services are interrelated and should also be uh, uh, treated as being interrelated. And that's why sometimes it probably is not advisable to split it up when having designing more prototypes and designing for mass production, okay? So products and services should be, when we design them, already think about whether um, we can efficiently and effectively create them and manufacture them, right? So thus the product and service design has an impact on the process design. The process design has an impact on the product design, right? There is a two-way correlation between those two. Right. Remember what we discussed in the second class when we looked into operation strategy. You recall that we call we discussed operational capability. Are we capable of producing uh, in the specification that is demanded from us? Right. So when we create a new product or service, we have to ask ourselves whether we have the process capability to produce this on mass? If the answer is no, we either need to develop these capabilities if possible, or we outsource and ask somebody else to manufacture the part component or offering that service for us, okay? So, and then the processes should be when we design the processes beforehand, already be designed in a way that the operation is likely to be able to meet the product specification. 
again, it's viewing it from, from the other perspective. There is a two-way correlation between process design and product service design, right? They need to match. Otherwise, if we have a gap in between, a discrepancy, then we have a problem, right? Um, there was a survey uh, in the UK which talks about um, why design is important. And I think even if this was from 2018, uh, if we go into 2022, 20, uh, that importance has grown exponentially. Why? Because consumers demand more because there are so many more competitors who bring out excellent products with cool designs. Why? Because of the globalization and you get any products anywhere in the world, right? So you compete against the rest of the world, okay? Uh, there is a case which, which I will, uh, um, I guess, uh, skip. But I think uh, the products, if you think about these were like the first prototypes of, uh, you know, the Dyson uh, Hoovers and whatever they, they produce. But uh, it's kind of interesting, I think, also because uh, you remember that maybe last year when they discussed to uh, establish their headquarters in Singapore. Do you guys know whether they did that or not? Is Dyson now in Singapore or are they still in the UK? Do you guys know that? Could open up their, their, uh, their headquarters in Singapore. Um, and um, it's quite an interesting company and uh, have a look um, at this case. I will upload it on the Brightspace. Uh, page, but we'll not have time to discuss this here in class at length. Okay. Now, what is designed in a product or a service, right? There are three things we can divide it to, right? A concept is designed, a package or packaging is designed, and the process is designed. So let's start with the letter, the process, right? Designing the process means the way in which the component products and services are created and delivered, right? So let's say you have designed a new ride at Disney World, right? A new uh, whatever fun ride. Now, then you need to design the associated processes in order to offer the experience to the customer. Right. That means um, how do I place this ride in a theme within the theme park? Right. Is it part of, I don't know, this world and that world? And then you need to think about all the associated processes with that ride. OK, you need to uh, how do you manage the queues? How do you manage the security? How do you manage the maintenance? How do you manage? cleaning of the machines, whatever it is, right? So that's the process, okay? The process can also be the manufacturing of that ride, okay? All of these are the processes. So the process of the service and the, the, the offering of the service and the process of the product. Similar, you know, we used uh, McDonald's as an example in the last couple of days, right? So there's the process of designing that new burger, and then there's the process of designing the package of that burger, and then there is uh, the design of the concept. The concept is something higher. The concept means the service, the product, or the combination. And that means the usage and the value of the product and the service, right? So it's not only about selling that product, right, that iPhone, but then you also need to think about how are customers using it, right? What kind of apps are they likely to need? 
what kind of cameras do they need? What kind of storage do they need? Yada, yada, right? So that's the concept. And then the package is the grouping of components, products, and services. Let's say in the example of a phone, a package could be the camera, a package could be um, the CPU unit, a package could be the app store if we go into a software application the package could be podcasts uh itunes right and the process itself is the delivery right do you understand the difference between concept package and process there's a difference in those ones yeah okay so let, let me continue so as i said earlier on the design activity of uh, making or designing that new product and service in itself is a process, right? You guys recall what we had in the first class, the introduction, when we had the input transformation, output process, right? And then we stress the input the transforming and transformed resources in the transformation part we are trying to add value and the output is then a product service or a combination of those right and most likely it is a combination now this also holds true for designing a new product okay but we are now specifically looking at the design of the product, which is a process in itself. So the transforming resource, design equipment, design technical stuff, and then what are trans gets transformed, for example, the technical information, market information, time information. And then the product service design process is again measured by the operational performance dimensions, such as, I don't know, speed, quality, dependability, cost, flexibility, right? And then there's the output is the fully specified product and the service, okay? These performance objectives uh, are coming back here, right? Now, this was also part uh, or the first question in, in, the, in the case of the roasties. Um, the design objectives are the same as the operational performance objectives, right? You recall them. Right? And these ones you need to remember, right? And we have discussed them in the first class, in the second class, and now they are coming. Quality, speed, dependability, flexibility, and cost. So to what extent is the output of quality? How long does the process take? It's the speed. How dependable uh, is it that it takes so long? How dependable is the quality? How dependable are we on time? How flexible are we? Can we change the process? Can we change the product? Can we change the service? Uh, how efficient is that process? Okay, these are the costs. Uh, and here you see um, something that has also been discussed in the case that a delay in the time to market uh, disproportionately delays the financial break even point, right? So think about the investment that we have to make <clears throat> in order to develop a new product or a new service, right? We need to think about um, remember in the in the in project management when we talked about uh, the payback methods do you guys remember that yes the payback method we discussed and uh, was associated with the net present value do we remember this or not hmm? what do we think you guys remember or not no Mm, disappointing. That means I did a very bad job in explaining this to you. Okay, and I apologize that this for you. If you if you haven't done or whoever was your lecturer and explaining this to you, but you guys already had project management, right? 
that you have so that's why uh, there is some things called the payback method. you can you can google it right it's very simple it basically uh, you calculate the years until your uh, investment uh, amortize, meaning that break even, right? And this is the same with investing in a project, because you could say that a development of a new product or service is a project in itself, right? As a defined start and end is unique, something that has never been done before, right? It's very complex. That's the definition of a project, right? So if we have a delay in the time to market, we also delay uh, the payback, right? In the break-even point. So then you have the developmental cost and the developmental cost of the delayed project, right? Then you have the delayed uh, cash flow, right? When it was here and it was here, okay? That's basically what it means. Now, these are the five stages in the product service design process, okay? These are the stages in the process, okay? Now, there's the, firstly comes the concept generation, concept screening, preliminary design, evaluation and improvement, and the prototyping and the final design. So, um, yesterday, you could have gotten until here. So the first three you could have done. Let's say um, without COVID, we could probably even go here, right? Evaluation. So you could say, and they did. They used uh, they they have their uh, preliminary design and went with their preliminary design to Whole Foods and asked the staff and the shoppers what they thought about um, this new shopping trolley, right? <clears throat> so you went through, uh, I guess, either implicitly or explicitly, depending on whether you had a look at these slides, through these phases yesterday, right? First, you start with uh, concept generation. So what do you think? You brainstorm, how could I improve? Uh, the existing shopping trolley, right? And then you probably had a discussion, a discussion, and then you uh, screen some of the ideas out, right? Here you could have, for example, done some market research, right? Um, interview shoppers, for example, interview uh, supermarket workers or owners, right, to see uh, what they think about this idea, and then you could have a preliminary design. That preliminary design could be done uh, by the company or by yourself, or you would outsource it and ask somebody else to come up with a model, right? Think about, for example, when they design a new car uh, with a new body shape, they used to have like clay models, and they still do, even even with all the computer models, right, to see and feel uh, the new shape of a car, right? And then you would do an evaluation of those ideas and try to improve them. And then you would have the prototype, which goes then to the final design, okay? What is important here, right? I'll become less uncertain and more certain about the final design. Right from the concept generation phase over the screening, the preliminary design, evaluation and improvement until the prototyping. Right. So from one end to the other end, uh, I become more um, certain of uh, how the final product would look like. Or okay. Now. Let's talk a little bit about the first phase, which is the concept generation. So how could you uh, come up with new ideas for either improving a product or a completely new product? They could come from customers, right? Through marketing activities. Uh, you could talk to customers, right? You could look at what competitors are doing, 
uh, there's a principle called reverse engineering where you take their developments and uh, and basically try to understand how they manufactured them ideas can also come from stuff right especially those with meat customers every day and from your r d department right and um, this is i guess to some extent related to what we said um at the, to what extent what we said in terms of uh, operations management, uh, what is the importance of operations management, right? To one hand, um, we said that um, an, a company can be engineers led to some other extent, uh, we said that the company is marketing led and then we see how important one is for the other one, okay? Now, these are just uh, bullet points in terms of uh, how we can generate concepts. But then think about it more from an industrial perspective where we have, um, for example, uh, brainstorming activities. We meet customers on a day-to-day -day basis. We talk to customers and see uh, what is their opinions about our products and our services. Generation ideas are generally more for incremental improving current and existing products to develop new products uh, that are not on the market yet. Those could come more from the R&D department of an organization or ideas from staff, for example. They are then executed by design uh organizations okay so some uh, assessing concepts that we have generated here so now when we go into screening we are at stage number two right concepts screening here we evaluate the feasibility for example of these generated concepts, okay? So some dimensions how we can um, evaluate these uh, ideas that we've come up with, okay? Could be the feasibility, how difficult is it to produce it as a prototype and how difficult it is to produce this in mass, right? Acceptability. Is it worthwhile to do so? Would we increase uh, our market share to do so? Uh, would we increase uh, our competitiveness? Would we become uh, or gain a sustainable competitive advantage if we change a product or develop a product that way? And the last one is related to the first point, and that is some form of risk assessment, which is called here vulnerability. What could go wrong, okay? And these then go further, these criteria, in the consequences. So meaning that what investments will we need? What returns could we expect? What could go wrong? What are the risks that we could expect? Right, and then we evaluate the concept, right? Whether a concept should be part of the new product development, okay? So as I said yesterday, it's kind of like a funnel, okay? You put all the concepts at the beginning in, let's say you are making coffee, you do a pour over coffee. So all the, co the, the water gets in, but in the end, what comes out? Down here then is the final design. Okay, with the specification. And again, this then is linked to the, uh, to, the, to the movement from uncertain to be certain regarding the final design. Also with regards to the screening and evaluation which we have here, which was what we had here. Right, so this is putting the things together and graphically illustrate this through a funnel. So first, we have the concept and the large number of design options and then over 
time, it becomes clear how it should look like. These are then the final design specification. So, and then over time, you become more certain and the uncertainty decreases, okay? Some ways to reduce design complexity. Think about standardizations, right? When you buy, um, I don't know, let's say um, certain cars from Volkswagen, with, uh, communal parts between Audi and Volkswagen and Skoda, so we standardize uh, parts. We can also not only standardize the product, we could also standardize the manufacturing process. Uh, communality. Right. Think about mm, we have a similar basis uh, and use communal parts in order to reduce the design complexity and also to reduce the cost. Or we take a modular approach. Right? Or the last one is mass customization. Right. I think I have a video on mass customization, which is kind of interesting. Let me see if I can find it and if you guys want to have a look. I think it was after this. Was so ideal? Ah, okay. This is check out this video on mass customization. Remember, we discussed mass customization in class number two or three. I can't remember. No, I think it was class three. We said we produce something in mass to reduce cost, and then we switch over. Uh, to uh, customization where we gain flexibility, right? And then we said it is like a, a combination of push and pull process at the same time. So check out how this is done from a technology perspective here. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see. Do you guys maybe want the link? then the T is better than if you watch it over Zoom. Okay, but anyhow, here it is. Check this out. The biggest challenge is to be able to make customized products at a cost competitive with mass produced products. That's truly where the challenge comes from. As far as manufacturing goes, the direction we took was to be vertically integrated. What it means in real life is to be autonomous and be able to provide ourselves with the right material, the right component, and you know, even the hour being autonomous like we are now will enable us to you know be on time do the right shape dare to do things that did not exist before rather than being told out in the market well that we don't do and we just can make happen our architect and designer involved in, in our the whole process look at us and say well we would like to have special stuff we said good we like special stuff because we're the only one that could do it we're the only one that could possibly make whatever your dream you have, we can make it. And the capability of the factory is based on this. We're giving our customers the capability to do any creative solution. We don't bring a limitation. Our manufacturing process that we can same the different thicknesses, different finishes. We can temper different glass at the same time and we can paint different colors for the same day, so it's clear to our customers, so a lot of flexibility. We could do two products like we could do in 2000. It doesn't make a difference for the process we have, because those flexibility and agility is, is available for any parts. But if the difference is that we can be on our new ideas, the direction that we have been working on and we encourage à pouvoir développer euh, des nouveaux produits ou euh, des, des nouvelles machines pour les, les fabriquer très rapidement, plus précisément. C'est ce qui fait que c'est motivant parce qu'on on a le droit à de nouvelles idées. When you do a final product and it's exclusive to you, that's only the first one, that, the only one you're going to have. It's almost like a unique painting or a unique artifact that has been built here, especially for that customer. By using this huge technical portfolio and all the capabilities that we have within Technion, honestly, when we collaborate all together, we can create this wow factor to our customers. You see, I think this is quite interesting, especially now when you think about all the technological um, developments that we have uh, and how we can actually execute. 
execute this uh, mass customization, right? Um, think about um, things um, such as uh, 3D printing and all there is. I was uh, once, was it two, three years ago uh, in, uh, in Poliu at the fashion department in Hong Kong, uh, Adidas did the presentation and they were introducing their, their there are 3D printing uh, facilities, which has been rolled out in a couple of stores where you can now go to an Adidas store and you can customize your shoe. Let's say uh, you, have a, you have the superstar, right? And you choose your own color, you choose your own name tag on it, and then you customize it the way you want. And then you can go, they have a, they have a cafe in their, in their uh, future store where uh, you can have your espresso or whatever. And in that time you wait, they print shoes, right? Which is kind of cool, I think, which is, uh, which is uh, a good way uh, to, to use this uh, design features of mass customization. There are other companies that have also used this Nike in form of Nike ID, where you can uh, on their web page customize the shoes. Vans also have uh, customization options. There are some uh, glasses manufacturer uh, for sunglasses and prescription that use like options um, where you can online uh, um, design your own glasses and, and they would send it to you. So there are multiple options that are, I guess, enhanced and uh, and really increase the value for the customers, right? What they also said in, in, uh, in, in this video. And you can create value by having this full part of the process where the customer can be part of the design process, right? And customize the product in a way that the customer uh, appreciates. Right? But you could be a film, because let's say in Adidas case, they would have the base model already be manufactured in the different sizes, and then they add the customization part on top of the shoe, right? That way you can offer and get the best of both worlds from a push environment and from a pull environment. And this becomes more and more important also from a design perspective, right? That's uh, what we had here. And you can also think about the modularization, commonality and standardization, those being the prerequisites of being able to mass customize, right? Which is very important. Okay, now let's uh, take a break, uh, have a coffee or have a tea. Um, now it's so difficult for me to calculate this. Is it nine, it, is it, is it 3.30 now in Hong Kong or is it 4.30? 3.30, 4.30, you tell me. For, ah, okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, let's take um, take twenty minutes, and we see each other at uh, four um, forty five. Okay. Okay. Let's have a short coffee break. See you in twenty minutes, guys.
Longa, thank you. Jams the Kula, thank you. Okay, so we continue. Are we ready to continue? No? Hmm. Are you guys back? Can we continue? Hello, are you guys back or not? Yes, so we can continue. Okay. Remember, we were at the reducing um, design complexity, okay? And then we looked at these optional standardization, commonality, modularization, and then we looked at a short video on mass customization and had a short discussion on this. Um, now, let's go back where we at in terms of this. Now we are here, right? The evaluation and the improvement. Okay. Now, the purpose of uh, this stage and also the goal of this stage is to take the preliminary design and uh, to evaluate how this can be improved um, or uh, before it is tested in the market. So, we are still inside the organization. So at the moment in, in the market, right? So we are not giving it out to customers to test it out. So we do the test, the design evaluation internally. And there are various ways to evaluate preliminary design. One is the, is the quality function deployment um, approach and value engineering, okay? Then finally, we have the prototype. And those prototypes can be, if needed, tested in the market. So the prototypes can come in various forms, right? So I guess the most uh, economical approach is to do it through a computer simulation. But other approaches, let's say, for example, when we build a car or when we build any furniture models, we could use clay models. Okay, or there are card models. CAD, for example, is used to have the computer simulations to see the prototypes, right? Um, here you see a typical illustration of the relationship between to what extent do we use uh, design resource utilization and the design process throughput time and the process reliability. I'll skip this, right? And then some simplification, whether this thing is done in-house or outsourced. Regarding this, we will do a case later today, right? And then there's a control of the resources, familiarity, accessibility, risk of knowledge leakage, okay? And then we have the option of doing uh, the stages in the design activity uh, simultaneously or sequentially. Right, and obviously there is a call to do some of these things simultaneously, right, in order to to reduce uh, time, okay, and to increase the time to market, okay. Now here you see um, this is very similar to project management, right? Where should the management activity or attention be at which time in the process from the knowledge acquisition to the launch, right? And at the beginning, obviously you have the time to uh, influence the final design. In the end, you cannot uh, in, uh, influence the final design uh, as much as at the beginning, okay? So we go through the phases of knowledge acquisition, concept, investigation, basic design, initial tests, pilot, prototyping, manufacturing, ramp up, and the launching, okay? And here you see another graphical illustration of uh, um, the time to market and when, when what it um, counts in order to, uh, you should rather invest in the early stages of the design activities in order to increase the time to market, to increase 
the fast time to market, which is the red line and the slow time to market, which is here, the blue line, right? And then you see some degree uh, of agreement over design decision. At the beginning, it's low. At the end, later stages, it's high. But then if you have disagreement at the beginning and you sort them out at the beginning, then afterwards, the time goes quicker, right? In terms of the design process. Okay. Um, you guys remember the different, uh, how do we integrate uh, project management into the organization? Do you guys remember that from project management? We could have like a project organization. We could have a functional organization. Or we could even have a matrix form. And then we said the matrix can be weak, balanced, or a strong matrix towards project management. OK. And here are organization structures, how I can uh, introduce and implement uh, project management in terms of designing activities into the organization, right? So depending on how important um, project management is or uh, product development is for the organization, becoming increasingly a project orientation, right? We have a pure functional organizational type if uh, we do not run anything on projects, we can have matrix forms. We have uh, optional uh, form um, basically uh, dominates. We could also have uh, a form that uh, we have an equal form that the functional uh, still dominates a little bit, but the project management becomes more and more strong. So these ones too are much more of a balanced approach. And this one is a strong matrix form, or we have a pure project organization, right? So we also have to ask ourselves, where does the decision-making and the management role coming from, from the project or from the, from, from the as a project manager or for the functional manager, right? And then organizing the design process in a way that it reflects the nature of the design, right? Um, thinking about functional organization, functional matrix, where we have or a lightweight uh, balance matrix or a project matrix or project team, also called tiger team we have here, okay? Now, let's go now into uh, what I said earlier today. We're gonna discuss the case that we had. Let me see if I can find it uh, here. Let's discuss the case of roasty crisps. Okay. So they are developing a new product. What kind of product are they developing? What's the thing that they are developing? What did you guys identify? What's the new product that they are developing? Hmm? Have you read this? Yes, no? What are they developing here? What's your opinion? Come on, participate. The quicker we can finish, the quicker we can finish. So now you got to work. What's this new product? What are they developing? Do we see anything in the text, what they are developing here? No? Hello? So here you see, they are developing a new form of snack food, which they call the savory potato cookies. Do competitors already have these kind of uh, snack foods on the market or are they the first coming to market with this? What do you think? Come on now, reply. Let's, they're the first, right? So, and I guess they are a little bit uh, worried that uh, the competition 
competitors would replicate and re-engineer what they are doing, right? Because what they're doing is something new, right? They have a, what they call disks of crisp fried potatoes with a soft diary cheese-like filling. Does this sound appetizing to you guys? To me, not so much, <laughs> but maybe somebody will like it. I don't know. Anyhow, me neither, not my thing. Okay. Now, the first question here is kind of interesting. How would you rank the innovation objectives? Now, now we need to uh, read between the lines what they said in the case. Okay. What would be, what would you say first objective for uh, this company? What do you think? What's the first objective? What would you say is the number one? If you go here in the slides, I put the objectives at the beginning here. Where was it? Yeah. What's the first objective here? I think quality and food safety, right? Would you agree or disagree? I think this would be very important here. I think this, this would be the number one uh, objective. Thank you, guys. And secondly, I think what's very important is what they call the speed here, right? So that they will be able um, to bring this to market quite quickly. I do not think, after reading the case, that cost is maybe the most important one. But cost is an issue when we talk about the resources that we have here. Because in the second question, what are the key issues in resourcing this innovation process? Right. The key issue, I think, uh, I would say is the complexity of the product, firstly. Right, because I think somewhere it says, uh, here it says perhaps most important, we must ensure that the crisps are 200 percent safe right that's what we had there but um these are the developmental um, objectives that we have there right and um they are thinking about then uh the innovation activities that they need and that they need help right they need help because they have no experience right in working with uh dairy products itself right and dairy product development no and then they are seeking uh, help from the inside or from the outside another i think important uh, consideration for um question number uh, two is that they are thinking about uh uh, pilot plant, right, where they can uh, take the product and develop those products. And they are thinking about uh, building one for themselves or outsourcing this. So I think these are some of the key issues uh, that we have there. And what are the main factors influencing the resource decision? They should be, the answer to question number three should be, uh, they should reflect the innovation objectives, right? Meaning that any decision that I make in terms of the resources that I put in should reflect that I am looking for quality and food safety and the speed, right? And I guess what is, uh, is concerning uh, currently is that they do not have a sufficient budget, right? 
And what does Monica suggest? What does she need more? What did she say in the text? You guys remember what she says? What is she looking for? You guys know or recall? What did she say? Hmm? What does she say? What is missing here? She needs more employees, right? A bigger product development team, right? She needs more staff that she says, right? So what advice would you give Monica? I would try to calculate um, the, the projected um, lens of the product development process uh, with the currently available resources. And then um, thinking about um, giving uh, a presentation or, um, or some documents to top management indicating uh, how many more resources would she need in order to um, to um, execute this project uh, in a specific period. Okay, that would be my suggestion. If you haven't looked at this case, please look at it again. Very important. Okay. Now let's go back to the to the learning area, and there is a case called Aaron Electronics. Okay, now we're going to work on a case. Aaron Electronics is a company uh, that is uh, based in the Netherlands. Okay. And then consider these three questions. It would be great if you could read the case uh, individually and then go together uh, in your team, okay, and go in a group. Let's say you have uh, one hour to answer the following three questions. What were the key structure and cope decisions taken by Aaron Electronics? What were the risks involved in adopting a process design that was totally dedicated to the one customer need? And what were the advantages and disadvantages of each location option to uh, function? And why do you think they actually choose to co-locate with uh, AE? Okay. So it's related to product development, but it's also uh, somewhat um, related to outsourcing and outsourcing decision. Kind of what we've discussed um, earlier today. So can you uh, work in teams, take the time to read it firstly, and then we come back and discuss at now it's five. So at uh, uh, six ten, we need back. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. So consider this. Read this. It's under uh, your learning material. It's called Aaron Electronics. Okay, good luck guys, see you in an hour. At 6, 10 p.m.
just outside Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, they offered precision custom coating and lamination services to uh, customers across different industries, right? But their main uh, customer was called uh, Panchem, which is a company situated in uh, Germany, Frankfurt. Okay. And, and there was some information regarding the, um, the Rotterdam uh, operation. And they were planning to uh, develop a new technology, right? And um, this a new technology, they, I guess, they betted on increasing large part of uh, Panchem's uh, future business, okay? Now, they had three options which they presented to uh, uh, the, the camp, to the AE's executive committee. They could uh, expand an existing site by building a new machine which costed uh, 19 million in capacity uh, capital expenditure. The second option was to build a new facility alongside the existing plant, which costed 22 million in capital. And then the third option, uh, which building a new, totally new site, which costed uh, 30 billion. Okay. What did they decide on? You guys remember? What did they decide on? Option one, two, or three? You guys remember what they decided on? Option one, two, or three? Hmm? Come on, guys. What did they decide it on? Option two or option three? What do you guys think? So in the, firstly, they said two, but then in the end, they went for the risky option, right? And the most expensive one in the option three, right? When they designed or discussed the designing of the new operation, okay? That was kind of um, interesting because um, they had uh, two options, right? The flexible option, and I, I call it the dedicated option, okay? What did they decide on? Which, which machine option did they go to? The flexible option where they can produce, have a production line where can they can produce multiple and different types of products or the dedicated option where they can only produce one type of product output. What do you guys think? What did they decide on? Hmm? Come on, guys, work with me here. I don't have the dedicated option. Hmm? Hello? They went for the dedicated option, right? So uh, they can only produce one different type of product. And they betted on okay. selling this product uh, mainly to punch them. Right. And then the case went on to discuss the buyer supplier relationship between AE and Panchem, or however you, uh, you write them. Right. And Panchem was actually uh, considering relocating. Right. In the end, uh, they actually located to uh, a facility across the road from AE's um, roadmap. So they were co-locating to co-producing and being together. Actually, in the case afterwards, they discussed that they used one door where one can go to the one and one to the other side and the, and the case um, closed with saying that the store is never locked, right? Now let's go to the, to the questions that we have here, right? There are three interrelated questions. What were the key structure and the scope decisions taken by Iron uh, Electronics? So, firstly, they decided on the expansion. 
then they decided on the location then they also decided on the business i.e machine that they were going through right these were the main decisions that they've taken question number two what were the risks involved in a process design that was totally dedicated to the one customer need right so there are two main risks firstly the technology might become obsolete or secondly the demand is just not there right so that it's not developing in the way that it would be those ones are uh, obviously interrelated right so these are major risks and they are betting on uh, making this investment and in this machinery in order to uh, to expand their business okay kind of similar um they were also then uh, betting on uh, a single customer, right? So they do most of their business with this one customer, right? Now imagine this customer um, gets into difficulties and it's not growing the way that it's supposed to grow or that this customer decides and uh, goes into a different business and uses different suppliers, right? So we have strong dependability, right? Now, not only on this technology, but also on this customer. So I would say in hindsight, it's it all worked out well for AE, but it was kind of risky, right? The advantages of uh, being close in the, in the location, being there are twofold, right? But the main one is that they could develop and enhance their collaborative relationship but they could also work together in terms of operational uh, collaboration. Let's say, I don't know, capacity management, inventory management, yada, yada, right? These would be the advantages. Disadvantages, again, if this relationship does not turn out the way that they're supposed to plan how it is supposed to turn out, okay? Now, that was it for um, session number uh, four let, let me rephrase and tell you what might or might not be important for the exam okay now what you need to know is the product and service design activity is a process itself and how it looks like right you need to know what are the product and service design objectives because we also discussed this in the case where they developed this new, uh, what was it, Chris, with, with some dairy in it, okay? So that you need to know, okay? You also need to know the design stages of the product service design. So the concept generation, concept screening, preliminary design, evaluation, improvement and prototype in each stage, okay? So these are all these slides that are following until here. So slide 17, slide 16, 15, 13, 13, 12, and 11, okay? That's about it. Any questions? Anybody has any questions? Yes, no, no, yes. No, okay, cool. So finally, one thing um, before we finish up, if you have the time and the energy tonight, I put up a reading on uh, Lego uh, from the FT. And that is about uh, how Lego makes a breakthrough um, design change in their bricks in becoming and recycling bottles. Okay, I think it's quite interesting, especially in terms of an um, innovation. Okay, if you have time, uh, have a look at this. It's very short. Uh, you can do it very quickly. Okay, guys, that was it for me today. I see you guys tomorrow and tomorrow we're going to talk about capacity management
you for a Friday uh, afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I appreciate again uh, your commitment to participate, and I see you guys tomorrow. Right? Thank you, guys. See you tomorrow.